that they don't receive psychotherapy at all. So to, to try to explain a bit on the method, we had all of the records, medical, mental health, medic, mental health, medical health. We gathered data for 18 months on each of the uh, persons randomly selected. The beginning point, time one, was the date, first date of therapy. Went back through the records for six months and extracted utilization information. The therapy was six months from the first day of therapy. We don't know exactly when therapy ended, but we made, the, as a practical matter, we had to make a choice. And so we chose six months from the first date. And then six months after, or 12 months after the first date is time three. So we have time one before anything, time two during, capturing at least during, and then time three, which is a, meant to be a follow-up. Our reductions in, in physical health utilization were of this size. One of, the, the, one of the most interesting results for me is the result for the family therapy other patient. Most often this was a dad or a mom, or most often a dad or a mom who went along with therapy. But our sample was pretty small in that category and we didn't find any statistical significance in the change. But it was really interesting to find that size of reduction potentially as something to investigate further. Here's an example of how that looks in the graph. A couple of key points. One is the individual therapy and the family therapy as the identified person. Both had about 10% reductions in healthcare use. This is comparing time one and time three. And that was, that's been consistent with the literature on medical offset. So we thought we probably had some face validity or, to our findings. We found about a 12% increase in healthcare use across the same period for the people randomly selected who had not received any therapy at all. And then for couples therapy and family therapy, the other person, and then total we had some interesting uh, reductions. Just let me get a time check, because I don't see a clock anywhere. How are we? Just excuse me for a second, I'll do that. I have one hour and 25 minutes. Please. Okay. Okay, I'll go fast. Sorry. <laughs> we thought the, um, so I just, there, stand up, there, watch. Okay. You sure it's not an hour and 25? How's it about that? We, we thought we thought we were interested in high utilizers, and these are folks that that use healthcare substantially more than everybody else. And one of the stories we've we have been told was that you know I think it's 10% um, of of patients use 90% of physician visits in an average practice. So we didn't know you know we thought we you know check this out. So we don't know if they were chronic illness cases in which more utilization, more use of visits is important because if you don't manage you know, certain illnesses, diabetes for example, it just compounds you know, terribly expensive ways. So we don't know if it was a chronic illness or there were somatic com concerns or not. We found a small group of, from our sample of 65 who were more than one or two standard deviations above the average for use. For this particular population, we had statistically significant findings of reductions in healthcare use in all of the therapy forms. 
I got pretty excited. This is what this uh, chart looks like visually. Yeah, this is a bit of color. So interesting, a little bit of theory about what this might be. So what, what kinds of change occurs most for these people? And you can see the uh, right-hand column is uh, the urgent care, which is, I, I feel poorly today. I need to see a provider. It's not an emergency. It's not a, you know, yeah, it's not an emergency, but I'd try to be seen right away. If you've had the flu recently or an illness, you might have seen, gone to an urgent care. So we had, we had pretty interesting amounts of reductions in those kinds of services in the family therapy, systemic therapy world, uh, but nothing in the individual therapies. Okay, so we're now gonna move from the small, relatively small HMO medical data set to a larger system. And this is uh, the Medicaid system, which is a govern the government insurance program for people that are poor. It's the largest funding source for medical services for low-income people, and the biggest single payer of medical services for children in the U.S. So again, we wanted to see, we can't establish that, you know, directionality, but we thought, can't, does, does this group of people who have family therapy seem to cost more? So we investigated conduct disorder in this case. This uh, data, I should say the HMO data came from a colleague who worked there who turned into my doctoral student. This data came to me from uh, Dr. Hillen, the second author, who worked at the, as an administrator for the Medicaid office in Kansas and said, would you like some data? That's how these go. I, would you like some data? Yes, I would like some data, please. And so they gave me a bunch of data at Medicaid system. Again, we're the, doing the, you know, the retrospective longitudinal kinds of study. Any treatment this Medicaid pays for is comprehensive. And so there's a, they call wraparound services for the conduct disordered ki uh, kids, some for their families. So there's not a, we, we did have the, the um, able to, we, we did have the cost of care down to, you know, kind of the aspirin for these kids and everything Medicaid paid for, we had the cost of that. In the description of the sample, we had two and a half years worth of records. We had really small number of youth who had any form of family involvement in their care. You know, less than 18% had any involvement in family therapy, family intervention. That, you know, that may be because these, these uh, kids don't have families, really, and that's certainly a possibility. But, but we do know that family involvement in the various ways for conduct disorder issues is helpful, but it's not being used in the field, I would say, in, at least in their system at this time. So we had, as I said, we had the cost of care for these kids for the um, two and a half year period. Those who had no family therapy compared to those who had in-office family therapy compared to those who had in-home family therapy. So to, to explain, this is, this is entire medical costs. This is not psychotherapy costs. It's everything from the MRI, CAT scan, blood work, medication, everything. It's not just psychotherapy costs, of course. We had one or two kids that were in the quarter of a million dollar cost range. They were primarily kids that were in lockup residential facilities. The in-home group probably was that low because they were involved in uh, prevention of foster care placement. And so the therapists who went to their homes uh, tried to prevent uh, displacement of the kids into other 
systems. And so our, our thought is that the families involved in this kind of service and this aspect really struggle to do anything in healthcare anyway. And so having trouble with poor resources, again, these are very poor people, making an appointment, transporting oneself to a meeting, you know, where all things are very difficult. So it might be that the, the family structure might account for that huge difference. So we're not claiming anything about what family therapy does or doesn't do, but just kids who have or don't have it, changes don't seem, do not seem to increase the cost of health care when family therapy is included. Uh, it looks like this in a graphic form. So uh, Dr. Hillen also said, would you like some data on folks with schizophrenia? Yes, but so he says, of course. So he sent us a data set of all of the adults in Kansas Medicaid system and children, adults and children who were treated for schizophrenia. So again, these are disabled folks. Poor, very poor folks. They don't have very many resources, of course. And so we went, uh, we had data for um, two years of their costs. We considered every person who had schizophrenia as a potential candidate. However, of that population, only 164 had any family involvement. I don't recall the number of total schizophrenia patients, but we only were able to find 164 with any uh, family therapy involvement, which is interesting too, if you know the literature on family therapy and schizophrenia, it helps keep people out of the hospitals and things. Well, it turns out it does actually do that in real applied settings as well. I think we needed at least one session of family involvement, that average and standard deviation you can see. In terms of uh, characteristics, gender slightly more male, about 30 years of age, mostly Caucasian. The expenses per patient for that two-year period range from 75 to 170 thousand uh, dollars. We had these data for these patients. We constructed a, a structural equation model to try to anticipate, explain. The you know, basically, it's a correlation between variables. With, it's very fancy, but that's what it is, or a regression that tries to explain the variance in one variable from the influence of another. In, in this particular case, the family, every family therapy intervention was associated with a decrease of almost $800 in uh, schizophrenia hospitalizations. Two sessions, almost $1,600 decrease in hospitalizations and so on. In, then we also studied general medical costs. And we had the same period, the same kind of uh, pattern, we think. It looks like the main reduction has to go, seems to go through psychopharmacological intervention and other kinds of therapy. So it, it was, it's really interesting to see if you're interested, the document is cited here. I'd be happy to send that along. Okay, we're now gonna move away from Medicaid, which is the very folks, very poor folks, and move into the Cigna healthcare system. Cigna then would cover well, you know, the complete range. They, they might have some Medicaid operation, they might not. They administer at least several hundred plans, so they're primarily a financial intermediary between employers and uh, patients and providers. They're pretty big, about 15 million folks as of the first of the year, and 32 billion in U.S. revenue in 13. So it's a big system. Our first study used 
data from, well, in this case, we had only psychotherapy records. We had nine million claims across this six year period, 01 to 06. We had diff approximately 66,000 different providers contributing to the services to these folks and about 600,000 unique persons, unique patients. All the di DSM diagnoses were represented. Uh, there was a range of zero to 103. I checked, zero is actually right and the 103 is right, which is uh, interesting. May, may zero might be somebody, might be a young a baby with uh, an addiction, born with addiction, I don't, we don't know for sure. Uh, as you can see, 60% um, women and 40% men, all states were represented. I wanted to make a couple of notes here. They'll be, we're gonna talk about the medical claims procedures and it should be, uh, you know, they're easy to fake. So the, we may or may not know accuracy of the reports, but because they're, they're completely self-report by the provider. They provide the diagnosis, they provide the procedure, and they provide the dollar amount and the dates of care. It should be, it's worthwhile noting though that uh, intentional misrepresentation of medical records or medical claims is a federal offense. And this is uh, getting the attention of lots of different um, people. About 10% of all healthcare costs in the U.S. are expect, uh, estimated to be um, medical fraud cases. So people who didn't see the person billing, people who saw them for five minutes billing for an hour, people, there's been cases of people, um, you know, stealing the identity of children, running their medical bills that didn't happen through cases. Uh, you can actually spend some, get some real money though when they find you. $20,000 per instance and there's a, also a potential imprisonment as well. Uh, a financial, I mean a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson paid an $80 million claim uh, against them for fraudulent medical billing. I should mention that uh, the industry audits are, are common so that the insurance companies do look for patterns in their data and submissions from whom, from what groups. And that if you know of a fraud, there's a, there's a whistleblower reward system. You can get big percentages of, uh, of the recovery come to you. So the $81 million example, I think the whistleblower's got about two million of that. I don't know if you can see this well. It's okay, okay. Uh, this is an example of a medical claim form. And somebody asked me to show this the other day. This is a sort of standard. It's a, you know, as a paper measure, as a paper instrument. It identifies the um, insured person, the patient, the provider, gives a procedure code, uh, what how much it cost, who did it, and then a, a, a testament that this is accurate. This is, a, there's a lot on this. I won't spend time on it really, but, but you, you fill out, it's again, it's the self-report of the practitioner providing that information. Okay, Let's see that the data that we had available from uh, Cigna was limited to these 10, these 10 variables. And so they didn't give us a lot of, you know, outcome data or quality or symptom submission, uh, symptom reduction or anything like that. They were limited to, we were limited to this number of variables across uh, 9 million uh, cases, 9 million claims.
So in, in, the, in the real world of cost effectiveness evaluation, this is really, really small potatoes and really narrow, uh, tiny little, little effort. But, you know, it is what it is. So that's okay too. Their definition of family therapy and their defini uh, definition of individual therapy <clears throat> comes from the American Medical Association. And the CPT code, the procedure code that you put on the claim form, 90806 for individual, 90847 for family therapy. A few, serve, a few definitions, episodic care is their administrative unit begins the first day of a psychotherapy claim and ends 90 days after the last claim. So if there's a gap of 90 days, the case is closed administratively. We try to identify some kinds of, make something out of the 10 variables that we had. And so we came up with using success, identifying success as folks who did not return for, uh, for therapy in the time frame. So we had, depending on the point of entry and exit of the individual, up to six years of, care, of uh, records for them. And then we, we thought uh, returning to care or recidivism with a, is a kind of a recidivism, uh, depending on the nature of the, kind of the problem that we're treating. And it's the same, it's returning to care at all with the same provider type. And so we so far haven't investigated cross-disciplinary uh, returning, but we meant to be simple in this way. In this business, the family therapy is in the room. So we don't, people number of people in the room, so there are two or more people in the room is family therapy. And we're interested in seeing does family, is family therapy cost effective as compared to other forms of psychotherapy? I'll give you a, time, a little minute, a few minutes to look at this. So this is an, this is an abbreviation uh, of our findings. You'll see the number of clients, this is, you know,